Hello, I'm Kate Jabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. A cache of top-secret US military intelligence documents have been published on the gaming chat service Discord. Among the assessments, one suggesting Britain has deployed dozens of special forces troops to Ukraine. We're taking this very, very seriously. There is no excuse for these kinds of documents to be in the public domain. They deserve to be protected. So we're going to get to the bottom of this. Professor of Defence Studies Michael Clark will help us assess the fallout. China has once again carried out war games simulating an attack on Taiwan, while the US is showing off a strengthened military partnership with the Philippines. The reason that this once-in-a-generation effort to modernize the alliance is happening is because China has scared the living daylights out of the Philippines. And it's not just fighter planes Ukraine wants, it's appealed for Western veteran fighter pilots to join its ranks. We hear from one who says he'd like to sign up. My wars were all sort of ambiguous and, and gray. This one's black and white. The chance to to help out with something like that would be something that I would welcome. More than 100 pages of classified U.S. documents circulating on the Internet, maps, photographs and charts, some marked top secret. Uh, in military terms, uh, Mike, this looks like a cluster. Yes, it does. I mean, we shouldn't be too um, uh, surprised that some are marked secret and top secret because that's not very secret in the way that classification goes. There are much, much higher levels of classification than that. But it does look like a, a cluster. And the problem is it's very hard to close this sort of story down because more of these papers keep appearing. These stories keep coming out and they look as if they'll dribble out for a few more days yet so that the Pentagon and the Ministry of Defence in Britain are always, in a sense, behind the story, behind the curve as they try to close it down and account for the damage that it might have done. So tip of the iceberg, would you say then? Yeah, we'll, I we'll think talk about... it may turn out to be. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about these two, two key points for the UK, though. There's the potential damage to military intelligence sharing. But let's start with the suggestion from these documents that dozens of British Special Forces troops have been on the ground in Ukraine. Now, we know and understand very well that details of Special Forces operations are kept secret by the government for the security of those operations and personnel. The government has warned against taking claims from the documents at face value. And we think it's important to give some context to what has been published along with the headlines it's generated. So let's just bring in the FBS reporter, James Hurst. James, hi. Um, just set out the details of this story, will you? So for anyone who hasn't seen seen the headlines, and they have been everywhere, the, the report essentially says that the UK, just a few weeks ago, had 50 Special Forces personnel deployed on the ground in Ukraine. Now, this comes from one of these seemingly leaked US secret pages. Uh, according to the BBC, that document is dated the 23rd of March, so three weeks old. Uh, I should stress we've not seen the document ourselves. It is, though, fairly easy if you're searching on social media to find a photo which appears to show this table in a document. That table also lists the US, France, Latvia and the Netherlands as having special forces in Ukraine at that point, a total of 97 people. That would make the UK Special Forces more than half of that number. So, James, what has the UK's response been? There's been no official statement, and you should not read anything into that. There is a, a strong, pretty much ironclad convention not to comment on Special Forces operations, not to comment on claims about them. However, uh, around the time that this story was published widely, the Ministry of Defence did post something on Twitter, seemingly a little more generally about the documents. The tweet reads, the widely reported list of alleged classified US information has demonstrated a serious level of inaccuracy. And it goes on to say, readers should be cautious about taking at face value allegations that have the potential to spread disinformation. Hmm, interesting comment. Uh, Mike, uh, to set some context here, people will see headlines claiming British special forces deployed in Ukraine. The obvious assumption many people would make is that they're somehow part of the fighting or carrying out secret raids. But if true that they are on the ground, there could be many other things special forces troops are deployed for. 
Yes, and if they are there, I can pretty well guarantee that they are not part of the fighting and they will not be carrying out secret raids because the risks would just be too great of somebody being killed or captured in, in doing that. They, it's not what they do. Um, although they're capable of doing lots of things, I always say that the special forces can visit paralyzing violence on the king's enemies where necessary. What they actually do is very unglamorous. What makes them special as special forces is their ability to exist in ones and twos or very small units, completely independent and they can just exist and, and they're recce troops. They actually observe what's going on. They send back information. They're an intelligence source. And so they can exist separately in the mountains of Afghanistan um, or the deserts of Arabia or the streets of London, if you're talking about the Special Reconnaissance Regiment, where you know members have, have been known. I mean, it's in the public domain now. They sort of pretend to be drunken homeless people lying in doorways for days mm. on end, just observing what's going on. That's what they do. They observe. And what makes them special is their ability ability to just do it without external support. And yet it's not unprecedented for British special forces to be deployed to a conflict in which the UK is fighting is not fighting on the ground. They're reported, for example, to have negotiated with local militias in Libya in 2011 for rescue flights to get British citizens out. That's right. And they, again, because they can move into areas and just as it were blend in more or less, they're perfect for going between warring sides or conducting negotiations. They've done it in lots of places, but you won't find any public lists of these things. But British special forces have turned up all over the world in, in various guises, usually in threes and fours. Uh, and James, the US is not denying, though, that these documents are real, is it? Uh, absolutely. They are clear that classified documents with secret, top secret intelligence have been leaked. That said, they have their own health warning. They say they are checking the validity of the documents, to use their word, to see if they have been doctored, see if they've been, been altered. We know, for example, uh, very easy to find two different versions circulating online of one of the documents, which is about Ukrainian and Russian casualty figures. Now, one of those versions has clearly been doctored and falsely shows lower figures for Russia and higher mm. figures for Ukraine. So, yes, Yes, leaked documents are out there, but they do still need to be treated with significant caution. I would also just add, as a journalist, if you are looking at, at these things online, in a headline, as a, as, as a news story, if you are just seeing a fragment of information from a particular page, one of the things you learn as a journalist is that if you don't have the context, you might find it interesting, but you don't know for certain what it actually means, even, even if it is an accurate piece of information, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. James, thank you very much for that. Um, Mike, Russia presumably is going to take this claim of NATO special forces personnel in Ukraine at face value. What's it going to make of it? And will it actually change anything in terms of what Russia does? Uh, no, it won't change anything in terms of what Russia does, because they will have known it was happening anyway. They fully expect it to be happening. Um, and they know, of course, that we're, we're helping Ukraine with as much intelligence as we can give them that's useful. And we get that intelligence from many, many sources, which special forces could well be one of them. But it does. It, it is a, 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 bo a bonus for the Kremlin in a way, because it, it, it will strengthen the narrative that it will show, according to them, that this is this this proves that, that we're fighting against NATO here and particularly particularly against Britain in NATO, rather than just about Ukraine. So it'll give them a, a propaganda boost, won't make any practical difference. But for, from that point of view, this leak is damaging to the West because it plays into that Russian uh, fantasy story that this is all about an attack on Russia to try to destroy Russian civilization. Well, the information contained in the leaked documents ranges from assessments of Ukraine's military capabilities to US intelligence on top-level conversations in Egypt and South Korea. We've had WikiLeaks, the revelations of Edward Snowden. Now, once again, US allies find themselves compromised by the publication of top-secret intelligence. So how damaging is all of this? Dr. Dan Lomas is a senior lecturer in intelligence and security studies at Brunel University. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, there are two types of damage here, damage from the information and damage to intelligence relationships. Yeah, I think the more damaging of these potentially is the, the impact on uh, tradecraft and the activities of US intelligence. In some of the documents, there are references in particular to signals intelligence and one of the latest revelations about the US uh, gathering information on the UN Secretary General uh, potentially refers to 
conversations between the UN Secretary General and other officials out there, meaning there is a potential uh, for people to to link the information to particular sources of intelligence. And I think that when that happens and when concerns about security are raised, people then begin to ask questions about methods of communication, uh, encryption, and it naturally means that potentially various avenues of intelligence sources that have been producted for the United States will be shut off there. The second question you raise, I think, is also an important one, the, the reputational damage um, to, to US intelligence. I would say that this, we, we, we shouldn't overplay this. Um, the 2013 Snowden revelations revealed that the United States spies on its allies, and there have been other revelations since. We also know that other US allies, particularly Israel, French, Germans, have also uh, previously spied on the United States. And we know in the real world of intelligence that there are essentially no friends and that the countries do spy on one another even though they are they are allies. I think for politicians, what might seem shocking, however, is that for this to be set out in black and white. Mm. Politicians and intelligence officials often know that this kind of activity does take place. But to see that in writing, I think it's a different it's a different story. So you're saying basically that um, we're all grown ups here. We know this kind of thing goes on. So the damage is actually quite limited. I think politically, in the short term, at least, there are going to be difficult questions raised. And we're already seeing that in discussions in, in South Korea, where obviously South Korea was identified as one of the potential US targets, where opposition political parties have already been pressuring the government for an inquiry into, into US activities. I would say that on the other, the other level, Many of the politicians who may express surprise, and I'm thinking back to 2013 and some of the revelations about US spying on the French, the French and the Germans, led to front page news stories of horror that the United States were doing this to its allies. But on the opposite side, um, De Velt and other newspapers were also reporting that German intelligence, the BND, frequently spied on its allies too. So I think that politically countries will have to feign shock. But actually, I think in the long term, this is perhaps not going to be as significant. And Dan, the really incredible thing is that many of these documents sat on the gaming chat service Discord for weeks, seemingly unnoticed. The leak is damaging, but but missing the publication for so long also looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Well, I think it's damaging in a number of ways. And um, for, for listeners today, there's um, the latest news article in the Washington Post. Um, they've potentially identified the leaker as an individual who was a young, described as a charismatic gun enthusiast who shared highly classified documents with a group of far-flung acquaintances. And he was searching for, quote, companionship amid the isolation of the pandemic. So I think this <laughs> poses several problems because on one level, I think, Access to information in the US, given the size of the US intelligence community and the fact that post 9-11, the idea was to push out information rather than to keep it behind firewalls, is very, very problematic. Um, and I think that when it comes to try and investigate these leaks, I think there are so many avenues for members of the US intelligence community, the wider military, or even people within Washington to leak information. I think it's, it's, it's damaging on, on, on that level too. Mm. Uh, um, Mike, let's just talk about consequences. Do you think we're going to see a restricted flow of intelligence, particularly military intelligence, between the UK and the US as a result? Uh, not really. Not, not a, a restriction in the flow, but I think all intelligence agencies will review what they have shared with the United States recently and what may still be in the system that might come out. What have we sent that might still appear? And is there anything in the next month or two that we might review but it's not the it's not the, the the British intelligence agencies will say well we can't deal with the Americans now. It's not like that because as Dan said these things happen every now and again, um, and every time they happen there is a sort of a problem of trust between allies, and you have to rebuild a bit of that trust. So they're used to dealing with this sort of thing. I, I think a lot of people in the intelligence agencies will roll their eyes and say oh yeah yet another one, and partly it, it arises as Dan said because in the in the United States since 9/11 that the theme is dare to share. Do you, you know, dare to share information to get everybody on board whereas in britain we still on on the basis of need to know do you need to know this if you don't need to know it, you're not going to find out and so there's two different cultures there between dare to share and need to know and it's those two cultures that sort of clash at times like this and how important is that flow of military intelligence if it is affected 
Oh, it's, it's, it is very important. I mean, again, the five eyes, Britain, America, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand. It's the premier intelligence sharing organization in the world. Everybody would love to be part of the five eyes, but nobody else can be. And it's all on the basis of trust. And trust is built up in lots of different ways because of people, personal relationships, past behavior and so on. And the military intelligence that is shared within the Five Eyes is absolutely gold. It's gold dust, what they do share. Uh, they don't share absolutely everything and they certainly don't share their sources, but what they share is gold dust that other countries would love to have some access to. And that won't, I think, be fundamentally affected by this. Uh, and Dan, just before we finish, we should also just address one theory about this leak. I know you mentioned the one earlier, but from the Washington Post, um, that it might be a US disinformation campaign to misdirect Russia in Ukraine. Do, do you think that could be true? Um, look, I, we, we have seen denial and deception being used extensively during the war in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians during their counteroffensive around Kherson um, and, and elsewhere have been very effective at using denial and deception. In terms of this leak, I think the detail, uh, 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 there is stuff that paints US intelligence in a very positive light, so they've heavily penetrated uh, Russia's intelligence community, and I think certainly there are things that the US come out of these documents in a, in a rather positive way. However, I think the information in there is just too detailed and can be extremely damaging there for this to be a, any form of deception. I would also point listeners to the fact that if this was just Ukrainian related and these documents were just about the war in, on, the, on the ground in Ukraine, that theory could be could have evidence behind it. But the fact that we're seeing um, topics relating to Turkey, Israel, South Korea, the United Nations shows that I think that you know this is more than mere chicken feed for deception purposes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Dan, you th Dan thank you very much for your time. That was uh, Dr. Dan Lomas from Brunel University. News, discussions and analysis. This is Sitrap. We've just seen China put on another big show of force in the Pacific, simulating airstrikes and rehearsing a sea blockade of Taiwan. Now, just a few hundred miles away, 12,000 American troops are carrying out drills in the Philippines. The largest ever US-Philippines exercise was planned well before China's last-minute war games. But this is a big show of a refreshed and very much strengthened military partnership between Manila and Washington. The U.S. is getting access to four more bases in the Philippines, three of them looking out towards Taiwan, one towards disputed Spratly Islands. And ministers from the two countries have just held talks in Washington about priority defense platforms in the first such meeting for seven years. Well, joining us from Washington, D.C. is Gregory Poling, director of the Southeast Asia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Greg, hi, thanks for your time. Uh, what is the strategic significance of the Philippines? Well, it's not all Taiwan. It, it's a little bit Taiwan, but it's, it's certainly not all Taiwan. The Philippines is facing the same kind of coercion and pressure that all the other, what we now call like-minded partners in the region, be it Japan, Australia, India, Vietnam, are facing. And for the U.S., if the goal is to defend the, the quote, rules-based order in Asia and push back against Chinese coercion, then the Philippines has to be a key partner in that, in both the South China Sea and in the broader regional environment. And what does America want to do with these military bases that it's being given access to? So this is an agreement that was negotiated way back in 2014, and from the earliest days, its primary goals have been uh, to help the Philippines modernize its own military. You know, the U.S. comes in, it'll build infrastructure at the bases, that infrastructure then becomes Philippine infrastructure. Uh, the U.S. will train and, and improve interoperability to help the Philippines. Now, what the Philippines wants out of that is maritime security, focused on the South China Sea, uh, disaster relief, since it's one of the most disaster prone countries in the world. And the Americans also expect that the Philippines will provide access for other potential regional contingencies, which may or may not include Taiwan someday. Yeah, and the Philippines, you say, looking for maritime security. How concerned are they about China? The reason that this once in a generation effort to modernize the alliance is happening is because China has scared the living daylights out of the Philippines for three successive Philippine administrations. Now, the last administration of Rodrigo Duterte bent over backward to try to appease Beijing, and they got kicked in the teeth for it, with China continuing to harass Philippine civilians and law enforcement vessels across the South China Sea. So today, the Philippine political class and, and the military says, well, if Duterte wasn't good enough for China, nothing will ever be good enough for China. 
Mm. We, we talked a little bit about those bases that the uh, Americans are going to get access to. Can you tell us any more about what actually might be there? Yeah, so we've now got a total of nine bases, the five uh, original set and this, this four new ones. Uh, two of those are up in Cagayan province, which is the one that faces Taiwan. The rest are either in north-central Luzon or out in Palawan, which faces the South China Sea. They're now a pretty even mix between air bases, um, a couple army bases, and a couple navy bases. I think what you're going to see the Americans and the Filipinos focus on for the time being are basic things like lengthening runways, building barracks and hangars and fuel storage. I mean, the real nuts and bolts stuff to allow modern platforms to operate. Because a lot of these, when you look at them, stretch the definition of a military base. And how much is this about America having a bigger military footprint in the region? Is it looking to station personnel there, for example, maybe missiles even? I highly doubt that we're going to be looking at U.S. missiles based in these facilities anytime soon. I mean, these are not American bases. These are Philippine bases. And the history of the, the Philippine relationship with the U.S., concerns about sovereignty are still very real and very raw. The Americans will not be allowed to do anything in these bases unless Manila gives the go-ahead, which means that everything for the foreseeable future is going to have to be focused first and foremost on Philippine priorities, which is not to put a bunch of American missiles in their bases for a potential Taiwan contingency. And you spoke to the Filipino foreign minister ahead of the talks that took place, and he said they still need to discuss how the U.S. could use these four extra military bases. It does sound like there's still a lot of negotiating to go on. That's right. And I think the Americans are okay with this. They understand that for the alliance to be sustainable and resilient in the 21st century, it's not going to look like the old basing agreements of the Cold War. It's going to be what the Obama administration used to call places, not bases, the kind of of agreed access we have, for instance, in Northern Australia, which, you know, more than 10 years ago, when we announced that Marines were going to start training in Northern Australia, nobody foresaw that eventually we were going to be talking about U.S. subs and British subs operating out of Sterling. But here we are. And what do you think the effect of this refreshed military partnership between the Philippines and the U.S. will be? I think the biggest effect is going to be to strengthen deterrence in the South China Sea, meaning that you know, the U.S. has made explicit promises since 2019 that its defense treaty with the Philippines covers any potential attack on Filipinos at sea. But without improving the ability of the Filipinos and the Americans to operate together, that's kind of an empty promise. So this is making real what has, has to this day just been rhetoric, and that should give Beijing pause. Greg, really good to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Gregory Poling from the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Mike, what is your assessment of these Chinese military manoeuvres in the last few days? Does that threat to Taiwan look greater than it did a week ago? Uh, well, it does in a political sense. I mean, the Chinese made it very clear that these uh, big manoeuvres, they surrounded the island of the Taiwan and they engaged in live fire exercises in order to make everybody quite nervous. And they said that this was a severe warning. That was the phrase they used, translated, a severe warning precisely because of President Tsai's visit, Taiwan President Tsai's visit to the United States. And as always, you know, the Chinese always respond to these diplomatic moves, like President goes for a visit to the United States. They always respond with something either military or economic that makes it very clear that they are pressurizing, they're turning the tap of pressure. So they're turning the tap of pressure up on Taiwan and they're demonstrating that, that in the future they may well choose to try to blockade Taiwan. And this was a, almost like a rehearsal for the sort of blockade that they might start to introduce in a few years time if they decide to embark upon the military solution to the Taiwan problem as they see it. Mm. Now, for months, we've heard pleas from Ukraine for Western fighter jets to be given to help in the fight against Russia. So far, no planes have been forthcoming, but now Ukraine's defence minister has appealed for Western pilots and aircraft engineers to step forward and help his country. The idea is that the skills of veterans with experience of planes like the F-16 could get those jets into the fight much more quickly and eliminate one reason for Western reticence. And it seems there are some retired military pilots willing to join the fight. Like Lieutenant Colonel Dan Two Dogs, as he's called, Hampton, one of America's most highly decorated pilots with 20 years experience in the F-16 cockpit. He's been talking to Simon Newton. 
politics aside, if they were really dead set on getting F-16s now and using them now or for the summer fighting that's no doubt going to going to start taking place here in a month or so, then the only way to do that then, if they can get the airplanes, is to get pilots that are already trained. And barring a, an allied government saying, yes, you can use our active duty military planes and pilots, the only way around that is if you get the airplanes, then we'll find the pilots from another source. The only way you're going to get that is by hiring private military contractors who are already F-16 pilots. You know, they don't need a year's worth of training to go do this. Who are those people? Do they exist? There are, there are, there are pilots who would be happily to, to sit and go into combat on an F-16. They're that confident in the aircraft. Oh, yeah, they exist. Uh, and it isn't just Americans. There's also, you know, you look at all the countries that fly F-16s. There's a pool of former military pilots that, that could be acquired for something like this. So explain to the uninitiated who haven't sat in an F-16, which most of us haven't, what, what is the kind of like workload like when you're flying that aircraft in terms of the actual flight as versus the, the weapon system management that you're doing? Well, the basic flying of the airplane is is delightful. I mean, it's, it's a very easy airplane to fly. Um, and to me, it's always felt like it's, it's something that I'm wearing re- re- rather than something that I'm sitting in. I mean, that's the feel of it. It's a, it's a fairly small, compact cockpit, and you can control everything with your fingers without ever taking your, your hands off the controls. The basic flight part, you know, after, after you start doing it, because the fly-by-wire system is so sensitive, it's more of I'm thinking about turning left and all of a sudden the airplane is banking left, you know, or I'm thinking about soaring up into the vertical and all of a sudden I'm doing it because all you have to do is, is exert, you know, limited amounts of force on the stick, which doesn't move much, by the way. And that translates into flight controls. So it's, it's, it's more like you're, you're, I don't want to sound, you know, prosaic with this, but it's more like you're thinking and the airplane is responding as you're thinking it. Unlike, older airplanes or the Russian made airplanes where you've still got to physically, you know, move a big stick around and, and do all that other stuff. The F-16, again, it feels more like you're wearing it rather than flying it. And it has to be like that because of all the sensors and weapon systems that you're controlling. If it was a hard airplane to fly, then you wouldn't be able to do everything else you need to do, which is the point of the airplane. And you still, you stand by the comment that you go yourself. Sure. Why not? You know, I told uh, Ukraine. I told the Ukrainians that because they asked me the same thing. Well, why would you come? And and my my answer is, which is something the politicians in Washington and other places don't seem to get, is this is not just a war for the Ukraine. That if the Russians win in the Ukraine, all sorts of bad things happen, and worse than that. If the Russians are allowed to win in the Ukraine, then you have China sitting over like a giant spider, you know, in the east waiting to see how this goes to determine what they do next. So there's more to it than just the fight in the Ukraine. But the fight in the Ukraine is a worthy enough fight. My wars were all sort of ambiguous and, and gray. This one's black and white. OK, so the, the chance to to help out with something like that would be something that I would welcome. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Campton. Uh, Mike, uh, is this a realistic idea, a force of Western veteran pilots flying Western fighter jets for Ukraine? Uh, well, it's it's plausible, as uh, Colonel Hampton said. Um, uh, it, it could happen, but it's an adventurous and exotic sort of idea. And the question is, would it make any big strategic difference? Because you'd have to have quite a lot of pilots and F-16s to make it work. And the point is that in this upcoming offensive, which the Ukrainians are about to, to start at some point, air superiority will be really critical. Um, and that's something we haven't seen uh, so far in the war. Neither side has air superiority. And believe me, the Russians will be going for it uh, in this uh, defense against whatever the Ukrainians are going to do. And the Ukrainians have got to be decisive in this upcoming offensive. They're only going to get one shot at it. And mm-hmm. so they have to be strategically coherent. And whether the idea of some foreign as flying a, 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 a few F-16 to make a difference, I rather doubt. It, there would have to be a lot of them to make a strategic contribution to something in which the Ukrainians cannot be afforded to allow it to fail. 
Professor Michael Clark, thank you so much. We really needed to know what you dared to share this week. And thanks to all of our guests. That That is all for now. We'll be back with another SITREP next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash SITREP or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. 